I think you're right. I think there is a culturally there's a willing blind, willing blindness is that we we go along. There's a willingness to be blind or to be co even complacent. Uh, there's a willingness to go through. There's a numbness that happens when we don't address evil in our life or sinfulness in our life. And so by degrees we get brought to a level of, of affliction or dysfunction and then we're suddenly aware something pricks our conscience and we're aware. But evil, there's a principle that evil militates to absurdity. You're seeing it in politics, you're seeing it in society, but evil militates to absurdity so that even the most numbed soul at some point is going to say, wait a minute, that's just not right. Yes, sir. I think it's reasonable to say that uh, many people who are possessed <clears throat> open themselves up for temptation, Ouija boards, other things like that. But I have heard that there have been some people who willingly accepted possession to fight it as a victim soul, but even maybe a couple of cases where someone was not open to that, but they became possessed. And I think there was a case in Germany where there was a young woman, maybe in her teens or whatever, that that happened to. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so the case of Annalise Michelle is an extremely rare case, and the exception accentuates the rule. So it's, it's, uh, what we tend to do is we tend to look at these um, extreme cases as an example. For instance, um, John Merrick. Do you know that name? The Elephant Man? So the particular physical syndrome that he had is not, as, not extremely rare. It's very treatable. And so the diabolical affliction is very treatable. It's extremely treatable. The cure rate is extremely high if someone is willing to do that. Merrick made the decision not to pursue treatment because that was his uh, method of economic sustenance. And so he made that decision. And so many people live with a diabolical affliction, even less than possession, but often possession because there's an economic benefit, there's a power, there is an influence. Many politicians are afflicted in this way. So I'm talking about openness. Openness. Was he open to it? And then because he got his weak support or things like that and then this happened to him? So what we talk about is is the term that we use is psychological compatibility. So the psychological compatibility that is the Ouija board is it is a mortal sin according to the Catholic faith to engage in divination, to, to, to pursue occult knowledge. That's not a by degree sin. So you, you can't dabble with a Ouija board. You can't dabble with tarot cards. You are doing something that by its very commission is a mortal sin. And mortal sin is a psychological compatibility with the diabolical because mortal sin is defined as a departure from conformity to God's will. And so once we're willing to act contrary to God's holy will, now there's a psychological compatibility. Does that make sense? It does, but um, those were people who were open to it. Have there been cases where there have been saints who said, I'm willing to undergo this, maybe it wasn't possession or something else, or maybe there was someone who didn't dabble into these things, but maybe they had a psychological compatibility like this young girl and a um, woman in, um, I think it was Germany. I listened to a, a CD, you know, maybe a 10 years ago about this one. And so again, the, while that can happen, it is extremely rare. Um, it, it is, and the exception accentuates the rule. So for the most of us, we're not going to encounter it. Um, over 20 years and probably 400 documented cases of possession that I'm aware of, there's one instance and it, it presented as if it were a victim soul. We got all the way down to the end. We got near liberation and it was in fact not a, a, a victim soul. And so, to understand that victim soul is extremely, extremely rare. And never at the instigation of the person. Always at the invitation of God. Right. So, if someone is, is under the mistaken, and there's many questionable private revelations, we talk about victim soul, but if you offer yourself to suffer, something's going to take you up on it. It's not going to be God. Mm. 
Do you see that awareness of that is increasing? Awareness of? Demonic possession. So it's, it's be, there's an increasing awareness because it's coming out into the open. The demon is militating. So back to your question, the incidents aren't increasing. The awareness is increasing. Those are two different things. And so there's, a, there's an increased awareness, but the possessions are actually down. And the reason why is because of our low susceptibility and because of our uh, lack of virtue collectively, we're easier to control at the oppression and obsession level. He doesn't have to go to the extent of possession. And so his, the, the possession is not his goal. His goal is to deflect you from pursuing God. His, he doesn't care where you end up, he just doesn't want you in heaven. If, you know, you, there's only one or the other. There's, <laughs> there's only one or two. But he's not, he's not so interested in possessing your soul as he is just denying God. <laughs> It's much more common. So to give you an example, about 80% of our cases, uh, clear up, 80 to 85% of our cases clear up at what we call phase one, which is the adoption of prayer and discipline. And prayer and discipline, um, practicing your faith, these things dispel the demon and gets rid of oppression. And that's about 90% of our, 80, 80 to 85% of our cases. Another, the majority of what's left is obsession. And in obsession, they become, the person becomes more and more psychologically compatible with the demon. Think of psycholo psychological compatibility as a, um, as a relationship. So, are the two of you friends? So you have a psychological compatibility. Now, to the extent that that psychological compatibility is consistent on multiple levels, now the friendship is deepening. And when the friendship deepens, then you realize all of these things that were compatible and then there's going to be one or two areas where you're not. And so I would venture to say because it's a beautiful Sunday afternoon in South Carolina, one of your um, compatibilities is the love of Jesus. All right, so if one of you decides because of a death of a loved one, a physical ailment, whatever it may be, but it's going to be something catastrophic, one of you decides, I no longer love Jesus. What's going to happen to the friendship? Correct. And so, the best way to think about diabolical affliction is a domestic violence scenario. And so, what happens is, the, the demon is going to, to, once you turn toward God, now he's going to want exclusivity. So he's going to isolate you and he's going to start to abuse you psychologically and or physically. And that's the way that works. Breaking up's hard to do. And so you, you've got to now detach and move away. And so the life over time that you've built together and the relationship over time you've built together now has to be dissolved. Does that make sense? And so you may have mutual friends. That's going to be tough. So all of the friends that you made while you were participating in this sin, a life of sin and debauchery, now you're going to need to get rid of those or convert them. If you've ever been through this process, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've ever quit a, an addictive behavior, you've, you just divided half of, your, half of the people that you know. There are those who will entice you back into the behavior that was detrimental, and there are those who will help you escape it. But you've just divided your friends. This is the division that Christ was talking about. I come with a sword, not to unite, but to divide. To, to make us choose. Does that make sense? Do we know if everybody's over from over there that's coming? I can take a quick peek. I'll take a quick peek. Okay, great. No father, son, no All right. It's not just your friends, but your family too. They're the worst. So all of you are fanatics. I don't know if you know that or not. You are all fanatics. And there are members of your family who will back me up on that. More Catholic than the Pope. So that's not a high bar right now. Amen, brother. 
<laughs> Other questions? Sure. Uh, it happens all the time. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on things like Harry Potter that like, the general population seems to think? Okay, you're a very kind soul. So look me in the eye and say, don't ask me what I think. Say, what have you seen regarding Harry Potter? Because I don't have thoughts. I can tell you what I've seen, and I can tell you what I know. So what you're going to hear today is not opinion. If, if I don't have objective experience, then I'm going to tell you I have no objective experience, and I have no opinion. Um, purposely have no opinion. So what I'm about to tell you is not opinion. And it's not, um, but you bring up a great point. So let's take a subject, any subject. This particular subject is Harry Potter and the writings of J.K. Rowling. Correct? So the question is, as a Catholic, the first thing that we have to ask ourselves, even as a Christian, non-Catholic Christian, the same principle applies. It's just in Catholicism, it's codified. Do you know what I mean by codified? It's written. It's a law. And it is this, is that we as Catholics, and when I say Catholics, I'm not excluding Protestants. I'm just saying this is preserved within the Catholic faith. We don't have to know anything. What we have to do is when we pursue knowledge, make sure that knowledge is consistent with our faith. Does that make sense? So if you are ignorant, which means not knowing, that's not a damnable offense. That's not a, that's not a problem. It's not a sin. But we're called to whatever we take into our body. Knowledge has to be consistent with the Catholic faith. So then we look at what are the criteria for something to be consistent with our faith. Those writings fail. Harry Potter fails that first test, that first level test, because of two things. Number one, and this is the high ground argument so you don't get pulled down into uh, the specifics. The high ground argument is that a big part of the story is that the ends can justify the means. You follow that reasoning? And so in Catholicism, the ends cannot justify the means. It means you can't arrive at a good through an evil path. Make sense? This is a foundational principle of Christianity, of Catholicism for that matter. And so, if I convert you at gunpoint, if I hold a gun to your head and say you will be baptized and profess that Jesus Christ is Lord, is that a good thing? You see what I mean? So, in the Potter literature, Harry Potter literature, and J.K. Rowling's writings, is this overarching thing that the ends can justify the means. Because the protagonist employs violent means, he employs curses, and then here's the second one, is he resorts to the dark arts in order to achieve the end. And you don't have to go any further. Does that make sense? And so it's like pulling something out of the refrigerator, it's got that blue fuzzy mold on it. You don't have to know the genus and the species of the mold. You just have to know that is not good for me. <laughs> End of discussion. Um, and so that's, so that's the, to address the Harry Potter. Now, Harry Potter has not been, in any of our possession cases, it has not been a primary factor. It has been the secondary factor in many of them. What does that mean by a secondary factor? So the Ouija board often is the secondary factor. The primary factor is this seeking of occult knowledge. Do you see the difference? So most of the time, the physical thing is secondary to the spiritual infidelity. Most all the time. We confess sins of thought, word, and deed. So you've got to go back and you've got to pick up where it, what's the thought? What was the thought that was deviant with uh, the will of God, which is salvation, which is purity, which is all of these things? Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. So, you're saying that you can't look at Harry Potter as strictly a fictional thing and 
you know, because mm -hmm. no, I don't believe it at all. But was I entertained by it? Yes, I was. So look, you and I are married, you and I are married, and the only reason that I'm having the fling with the girl down at the quick stop, it's purely aerobic activity. I'm doing it only for fitness. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> when, you, when you do it that way, it really it just smacks you in the face. So inconsistent with Catholic faith means inconsistent with Catholic faith. Okay, so number one is, uh, well, I'll just ask a question. Are these Catholic children? So, so my children are Catholic, but the other kids are, there's one Christian and there's two Catholic Okay, so the question is, what do they have in common? What's the psychological compatibility that is this friendship? Uh, neighborhood. Okay, proximity. Yeah, proximity. That's no, that's no way to build a friendship. And so I'm not going to die for people in my neighborhood. I'll die for you guys. <laughs> but you see what I'm getting at. And so you, you have to look at your friends. And where I'm drawing this from is uh, Pope St. Leo the Great did a series of homilies called Holy and Unholy Alliances. And what he said, again, back to psychological compatibility, he says, you will assume the attributes of those with whom you associate, both for the good or the bad. And so we need to associate with those which will serve our goal, which is to, to grow in holiness and to um, cultivate relationship with God. And so every relationship we have can be um, analyzed on this criteria. Does this person make me want to be a better person? Or does this person constantly ask me to compromise my values, my virtue, my deportment, my decorum? Those things. That's the question we've got to constantly ask ourselves. And so desire is going to operate differently in a Catholic child, a Christian child, than it will in an atheistic child. Because the, the, the medium of communication between their souls and he who created the, those souls, that's a different medium of communication. Does that make sense? And so they're not all breathing the same air. They're not all drinking the same water. You cannot. They can't hear you. You're going to sound like the adults on the Charlie Brown cartoon. But what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's more about the, you said it's because the end for justified means in that book. But that's something that can be found in a lot of modern literature, movies, TV shows, and therefore we should see those all within the same. It's a general principle that can be. To, it's a general principle that can be applied across the board. I had a teacher once that said, um, "Environment is stronger than will," and so what I think we're seeing a lot in our society today is the slippery slope. You know, you start here and then, oh, well, then this happens, and then this happens, and this happens, and that's how our general society is just going down the tubes. You take one step off of your ideal, and it's easier to take the next step and the next step. So what, who and what we surround ourselves with as to what Precisely. we're saying is stronger than our own level. We have to keep the supremacy of the intellect and the will. We have to keep them as the highest faculties and not descend down into emotion. Once you descend into emotion, you give up the higher faculties and de facto you're insane because you're basing your decisions on a lower faculty of emotion rather than a higher faculty of comparing the, the known against the absolute truth. Is that confusing? Good. I can, yeah, because that's a, that's a good, I think it's, yeah, I think so. So is everybody over from having their throats blessed? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, so we're ready to talk, start our talk? Yes, sir. All right, am I wired for sound? You're good. I'm good, I'm, 
You're, you get good. All right. All right. So this has to do with spiritual warfare, um, and it, we're going to come at it from a from a little bit different direction. So we, we were doing the Q and A, and we came across this understanding. So this is a Thomistic understanding of the human person, and that is the des- faculties in descending order are intellect, will. memory, emotion, appetite, our desires, and instinct. In descending order. So the pagan and the Christian are diametrically opposed in the following way. In the Christian, these should be ordered this way, and in the pagan, they are ordered this way. Meaning the primary function is instinct, which is preservation of corpus, preservation of self. So both the pagan and the Catholic or Christian are looking out for number one. Both of them are looking out for number one. The difference is, who's number one? So for the the pagan, he's number one. For the Christian, the Catholic, God is number one. And this is the total difference in this orientation. Because we know the absolute truths in our intellect of a triune God, a creator, and all that flows from that understanding. That's in our intellect. That's the absolute truth. And so what we have to do is compare what's happening to is it consistent with the absolute truths that are stored in my intellect. And then we have to will our own behavior, our own action requisite with what is in our intellect. Does that make sense? Okay, so how does that break down? I know in my intellect that that Second piece of cheesecake is not good for me. And the weakness in my will makes me go down here. Do I have to confess that? You just did. You just did. (laughs) But you see what happens. And so the the pull of the lower faculties, the pull of pleasure, of appetites, desires, and instincts, and we'll go through this. Here's something that's extremely important to grasp from a spiritual warfare standpoint is from here down. This area, everything here, the demon can be directly present to. What does that mean? He can't be in your intellect. He can't be in your will directly. Only through your lower faculties. And they have a flesh component. Your lower faculties all have a flesh component meaning there's, a, there's something of our flesh, and the demon is allowed to afflict our flesh, afflict us in our flesh. Everybody good? Okay. And so the way he does that, he's most active right here in the memory and the emotion interface. So in the memory and emotion interface, this is how we relate to past events. We draw on them. This is, you remember we talked about the ability to see patterns? And so, if someone perceives rejection, then they pull up all these files of previous rejections. Right? What happened to me the last time? How did I feel? What are my memories? What are my emotions? And you see how this can spiral downward. And then we seek to assuage or to calm the lower, even the instinct, I've got to preserve myself in this. That's when you open that half gallon of bluebell. You know those tops go back on? (laughs) Yeah, I had no clue. (laughs) New discovery. (laughs) But the point is, is we are ritualistic by nature. So when something happens to us, we go back to our file, we say, what did I do the last time? How did that work for me? And then we go through ritualistically that response. The demon, if he can force you into a negative memory or emotion, 
then he's got you. Now he can drive the bus. And so what you have to do is you have to constantly purify the memory and the emotion in light of what you know to be absolute truth. I'll give you an example, functional example. How many times has something happened to you that at the time it happened was absolutely horrible? Loss of a loved one, loss of a job. It was terrible. Six months later, you're saying things like it was the best thing that ever happened to me. You ever see that ever happened? So it's exactly the same event. What happened? This was purified in light of thanksgiving rather than anger at God. Make sense? So this is the function of charity or thanksgiving back, given back to God. That no matter what happens, it has a salvific purpose. It has a salvific potential. And the demon wants you to think it does not. Now we as Catholics and Christians, we're, we're navigating a pagan world that is oriented exactly opposite. We're trying to achieve sanctity, heaven, everlasting life. We're, these are the things that we're trying to achieve and the rest of the world is not. And in fact, they're militating against those concepts. So a good example is there is only one word difference between Lucifer's reaction to God and Mary's reaction to God. This is why Mary occupies this space in theology, is this one exchange. Mary says, scripturally, she says, let it be done unto me according to thy word. And Lucifer says, let it be done unto me according to my word. And so it is in that moment that you see the difference between number one for Mary and number one for Lucifer. Do you see it? So anytime the demon encourages us to think, how will this affect you? What is the effect this is having on you? Then he's got you not only distracted, but he's got you 180 opposite where your focus needs to be. Because if he can get you to ask why, why is this happening to me? Then you'll never ask how. How can I use it for my sanctification, for salvation, for me and for others? Do you see the, the shift? Do you see the difference? And that's happening liturgically in Septuagesima Sunday as we descend through the light pale purple down into the dark purple of Lent. So where we are right now is we're considering repentance. We're in this shadow area right here where we're saying, maybe there's something more than the why, because I can't answer the why. My intellect tells me the answer to the why, but we don't want to hear it. What does your intellect tell you? Anytime something happens, you know, what do you know about God? What is the absolute truth about God? God is fill in the blank. Exactly. God is love. God is charity. God wills your salvation. We know that to be absolute truth, right? So why does He allow these things? Wrong question. You see how we're struggling with the answer? Now, change it to how. I know God wants and wills salvation and union. How do we turn this thing into that? That we have power over. Make sense? That we have power over. That's within our purview. That's within how do we dispose ourselves to what's happening in the world. And right now is the greatest time in all of history to be alive for you. Why? Because God decided you needed to be alive right now. And there's no shortage of opportunities to work the how. You notice that? MacArthur made the uh, statement, they were surrounded, he said, we're surrounded by the enemy. We have them just where we want them. <laughs> <laughs> that no matter what we do, which direction we go, we're going to encounter the enemy, thanks be to God. There's no such thing as attack. It's opportunity. It's opportunity. So when we start speaking that language, we're already talking about the how, 
not about the why. The demon wants you stuck right here in the why because in the why, he can accuse God. In the how, now you've already moved. So Septimagesima is that dim purple as we're headed toward the deep purple and we're realizing that this is the beginning of repentance. I want to change. And so in our discussions, when we go th take people through the uh, examination for extraordinary diabolical activity, this is a movement. It is repentance followed by metanoia. Now those words are interchangeable in most theology, but here's the difference we're making. There's a slight difference in Greek. And that it, repentance is the, is the desire for change. It's down here. This is the realization my pants are too tight. And then my intellect tells me there's a cure for that. Lose weight. My instinct says buy bigger pants. <laughs> but I'm listening to my intellect and I'm realizing, okay, I want to lose that weight. And I can want to lose that weight till the cows come home. When am I going to start losing that weight? Any of you? Is there another option? <laughs> That's what we always want to say. But until I eat less, until I eat less, until I do something tangible, requisite with that desire, then I'm not going to affect anything, correct? So now we come to the will. And so the metanoia is the concrete things that are being done in the will, by the will, to affect the change. Does that make sense? So you got a lot of people who are stuck at septimagesima. We're stuck at the repentance. We're stuck at, I need to make some changes in my life. Are you willing to do it? Because septimagesima is it's such a wonderful season because what's happening is, do you notice that it's happening right about the time your resolutions are losing steam? You notice that? So now's the time to say, okay, am I going to up the ante or am I going to fold? Am I going to quit eating or am I going to buy bigger pants? So that's the question. Now, Let's overlay this with what I, where I really wanted to go um, before I get there. Anyone got any questions on where we are up until now? Do you see how this works? How we become vulnerable, how we become psychologically compatible. And so we've thrown out some terms. I want to clear them up before I go any further. And that is we threw out oppression and obsession and possession. So let's talk about those things. Oppression, the demon is on the outside. He's on the outside. He's on the exterior. And what happens is there is a, a it's like a cloudy day. There's no sun. There's no joy. There's a heaviness. There is a, um, a sense of, of voting. There is futility. There is despair. And so the person of the Trinity, and this is something that I wanted to, to put in right here, the three persons of the Holy Trinity. Let's look at them in light of, so the three persons of the Holy Trinity are God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are God. And so, as you look at the three persons of the Holy Trinity, there's three theological virtues. What are they? Faith Correct. Faith in God the Father begets hope in Christ the Son and is perpetuated through the charity of the Holy Spirit. We confess sins of what? Thought, word, and deed. God, the unseen God, the God of thought, speaks the Word, and it's perpetuated in the ongoing deed. Thought, word, deed. This is also creation. This is the creation account. So you just see the overlay of these things? So what's, 
The sin against hope is despair or futility. We've been confessing those lately? You've been feeling them interiorly? So this is a sin against the Son. Once you put it in this, you see which person of the Holy Trinity is being targeted within you. Do you have anger at God the Father because He allowed something to happen? Do you hear the demon telling you a good and loving God wouldn't allow this? Now we're back to that why. You remember that? So listen carefully. And then the charity. Situational ethics. The girl at Quick Stop, she has that attitude. You know, she talks like a millennial. <laughs> and she actually cursed you. you. At least you think she did through the croak. You know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the affectation that is meant to grate your nerves. Did it work? So anyway, you, situation, you adapt situational ethics and so now you treat her differently. So ch that's charity. To see her as less than. If you see her as less than you, who are you, who are you psychologically compatible with? Lucifer. This is Luciferian. So you have to look at her in the same way that Don Quixote looked at Dulcinea. You have to, to see the beauty in her when she doesn't see it in herself. And so then the reflection she sees in your eyes, that's absolutely disarming to the demon in her. And this is how spiritual warfare is fought. This is how it's effective. So you look at which person of the Holy Trinity and just be thinking in your mind, okay, what attack, where is this focusing? Where is this really trying to get me pulled out of right relationship with the Holy Trinity. Making sense? Alright, so most of spiritual warfare is self-defense. You've got to be able to protect yourself before you can help anybody else. We've all flown. What do they tell you about the oxygen mask? Make sure your oxygen mask is secure before you help those around you. Remember that little speech? So, make sure your relationship is right, stable, and sustainable before you try to do this to somebody else. Now, the next level of spiritual warfare is understanding that he really had, the demon, has little interest in us individually. He really doesn't care about you individually. You are a means to an end. And so what he's looking at is your office. What are you? Are you a husband? Are you a wife? Are you a mother? Are you a grandmother? Are you in a position of formation? Are you a teacher? Are you a coach? Are you somebody who is in a formative position? If so, you're a target because of your office. It's your office that's being targeted. Does that make sense? And in a marriage, he's not after one or the other. He's after the marriage. That's what he's after. Because that's a conduit of grace. Grace flows through marriage. It flows through vocation. So what he's trying to do is attack that office as a conduit of grace because you've got to remember why were angels created? To augment the flow of grace. And so if they fall, if they become demons, they've got the same zeal, they've got the exact same mission and purpose, it's the exact same nature, it's just that now it's turned 180 degrees. And so instead of being an augmentation to grace, they are an impediment to grace. Does that make sense? And so they seek to impede the flow of grace. And so that may be through the attack of a key person, but more often it's the attack on an office. And as soon as you lead a group of people in prayer, as soon as you share the gospel, as soon as somebody starts to see within you a model of behavior or wants peace that you have or wants and sees something in you that they would like to be like, now you're a target. Now it's game on. And it's not personal. It's just, especially if, if you are in a position, I can't stress how, much, how important it is, if you're in a position of formation for young souls, if you are a CCD teacher, if you're an RCIA teacher, even if you're, a, um, if you're a coach, a scout leader, whatever it is, 
If you are teaching young people and forming young people in the ways of virtue and right behavior, you're a target. And so the problem is we expect that because we are right, we're going to be protected. That's a false expectation. That's absolutely a false expectation. When you are right, you become a lightning rod. And so the other side will seek to destroy or at least distract in any way it possibly can from this effort. Does that make sense? Okay. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you realize it, once you intuit that you are under attack, that this is under opportunity, that this is, your efforts are being opposed, then immediately get to distance and say, okay, it's not me, it's this office. And that gives you some protection because what he's going to want to do is make this about you and get you to make it about you because then he gets you down here. Make sense? Okay. So, now let's talk about with regard to faith, hope, and charity, everything flowing through Christ. It flows through, grace flows through the sacrifice on Calvary. All grace flows through this. Here's something that we have lost in the Catholic Church modernly. It's still on the books. It's still the, the right way to, to look at everything is in light of sacrificial theology. Everything is about sacrificial theology, about us giving ourselves back to God. Once you begin to adapt this understanding and to live for God, for God's sake. Now, this, there's a difference between loving yourself, loving God, and loving God. There's a difference. And so, the demon wants you to love yourself, loving God. That's a, that's a blind loop of charity that only services you. And so, when we do something, if we feel better about ourselves, first of all, good self-esteem is not a Catholic concept. It's simply not. The, the spiritual masters, the, the great spiritualists, um, John of the Cross, Dom Lorenzo Scapoli, Blessed Marmion, all of those write about the value of self-doubt, the understanding that where we are weak, that's where God makes us strong. We don't do anything on our own that is good without God. That's, a, that's an illusion. And this idea of self-esteem, we have to have esteem or understanding of who we are in Christ Jesus. That's, that's where our identity lies. Does that make sense? And that will help you with family. Jesus constantly tells us you have to reorder your family. Reorder. Who are my brothers and sisters? Those who keep my Father's commandments. One of the biggest lies out there is blood thicker than water. How many of you have heard that? The waters of baptism are more bonding than the blood of family. This is the, this is the way to understand this. Is this is your brothers and sisters. <clears throat> These are going to be the people that you spend eternity with. And so your family... This is one of the hardest things that we have in, in cases of obsession and possession is the inability to detach from family and reattach to holy family. That makes sense? To reorder our lives. You know, scripturally it talks about you have to leave father and mother, cling to your husband, cling to your wife, develop this new household. These are very, very hard things to do, especially in this country. We do not know how to parent adult Adults. I'm not going to use the word children. There's no such thing as adult children. If you, if, you make your, if you stop and catch yourself and don't talk about adult children, talk about adults who were once my children. Then you've got a clear-eyed understanding of power and authority and how that works through the natural law and the divine, the divine law. Does that make sense? But we still want to exert authority over those adults that were once our children over whom we no longer have authority. And this is a, a cause of great angst. This pulls us back down into that memory and emotion. It pulls us out of that high ground of intellect and will. So if you've got questions on that, 
I'm going to stop right there for a moment and answer some questions because this is a tough, tough area. So when you're saying authority, like we can still pray for them, right? But not necessarily parent them. That well, the talking. quality of the prayer changes. Okay. The quality of the prayer changes because your relationship has to change. And so to understand power and authority flows through, your power and authority flows through your office as husband and wife first. Everything goes through spousal union first. That's where we're going to go next, is how to keep that pure. Then it goes to fatherhood and motherhood. So one of the problems modernly is when you ask somebody to identify themselves, they'll tell you, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather. So this is a disordered identification. You have to first identify a spouse. Just follow the line of grace. Follow the, the way that flows. And so then authority, as the person ages, you got, you got things happening. So the person, uh, the, the child, he's going, he's developing faculties. And so at, at this point, he hits the age of reason. Does everybody know what I talk about when we talk about the age of reason? All right, so what is he before the age of reason? Irrational. It doesn't mean he's crazy. But understand, St. Thomas talks about the development of the faculties is in an ordered and sequential way. And it comes with matur maturity. Stop and think about it. The three-year-old is not a rational creature because he's yet to develop it's developing, but he's yet to develop reason. What is reason? It is the concert of the intellect and the will. So if he's an irrational creature, he is de facto a corporal creature. What does that mean? It means he's living in his lower faculties. It's all emotion, it's all appetites, and those have to be shaped. Make sense? So now I'm going to say, I'll say plenty of things that are politically incorrect. But do you see the necessity for right ordered corporal punishment for the irrational creature? Because it's all, it, it is truly all that they are going to be able to assimilate. That actions have consequences. And if those consequences are painful or uncomfortable, then the quicker the association is made. I'm not advocating abuse. Corporal punishment can take many forms. It can take, go sit in a corner. But have you ever seen the well-meaning father when he's got the ring-tailed tutor in mass and he takes him out screaming and you can hear him. Now, son, we just can't act that way in mass. Is that going to bring about a moment of clarity? No. I was a boy. I've raised boys. We are corporal creatures. To be very crude, my grandfather used to call us red-butted monkeys. <laughs> we, were, we were totally pleasure-driven. And children are. And that's, that's part of this existence. So this has to be shaped and formed so that when they reach the age of reason, and this doesn't happen overnight, there's a realization with this. This is why in the Catholic faith we bring these sacraments along as they're reaching the age of reason so that by the time confirmation happens they're at a spiritual maturity and the rational quality should be functional at a high rate. So that's analogous to bar mitzvah in the Jewish faith. In bar mitzvah in the Jewish faith what's really happening as they come of age is that this young man is now responsible for his own sin. So the sacrifice of his father, the household sacrifice, no longer covers his transgressions. And his confirmation, as we do that in the Catholic faith, or the proclamation of, of, of faith for um, some Protestant faiths have, as, a, as someone nears graduation from high school, they stand and proclaim their faith. Well, now it's theirs. And the sin, what's universal is, their sin is now their own. They're becoming more and more understanding. Now what happens at the age of reason is we do First Communion. What precedes First Communion? Confession. confession. Is the realization that part of, of being of the age of reason is the rec a recognition of sin. And that it has a consequence. Does that make sense? 
So when we deal with uh, diabolical affliction or supposed diabolical affliction in people who have mental defects or mental arrest, failed development, Down syndrome, autism, etc., first question we ask is, do they have requisite reason? Not have they reached the age of reason because it's not a function of age. The question is, do they have requisite reason? And so this is going to tell you whether they are responsible for their sin or not. And to what degree are they culpable? Are they realizing the function of sin? Does that make sense? To what extent are they responsible for their actions? So let's put again. Let's put it into mystic terms. You're right. You're asking, do you have right of command? And so that's what Saint Thomas says: is you have here right of command because you're responsible for their soul, and it's absolute up until the age of reason. And in fact, it is an obligation that we discharge this under um, under right order that we let them know what is right from wrong. We school them with regard to if you do these things, it has consequences. So that not only is a right to command, it's an obligation to command. Now the obligation drops off at right to reason and you still have a right to command. This includes, now whenever I say this, it also includes imprecatory prayer, directly adjuring a demon to leave your child alone, etc., the ability to lay your hands on that child and cast out whatever's there in the name of Christ, but by your authority over them as their parent. Okay? So that's still there. Obligation drops off. Command continues until they reach the age of majority or they leave the house. If they remain in the house, now you've got a divergent thing. And you can quiz Father Ripperger on this. The, uh, you can really go through it in the book of Dominion. But we see it functionally. So you ask a very important question. Do you and your husband have the right to command these adult children? You don't. He does. And here's why. Here's why. It flows. Authority flows through the patriarchy. And it, this is not something that we're making up. And it's not meant to be onus. It's, it doesn't militate against the, the dignity of a woman. That's not it at all. When we get to sacrificial theology, you'll see how this overlays. But it, the obligation, the responsibility is his and his alone. And so, because they are in the household, the head of the household has this obligation to command as long as they're in the household. So we have a departure from natural law and divine positive law. The natural law is operative because this principle is operative in every pagan household as well. You will follow the rules of the house. And if the rules of the house are, there is no person living in, under this house to be engaged in habitual mortal sin, then this means nobody misses mass. So that's the functionality. The man is responsible for maintaining the spiritual integrity of the household. That's his responsibility. And if he doesn't, He's the one that answers for it. Did you see how that works? I wish he was here because he needs to hear this. <laughs> I mean, seriously. The other question is going back to, oh, we have a son who's autistic. He can function on his own. He lives on his own. But do we, as, does his dad still then also have that same authority? You know, you need to be at Mass. You need to do this. You need not to if he's that. not living in your house. Okay. And but so, he's being... Um, he gets some disability, but otherwise we're financially taking care of him. So is there any tie-in with that? Yeah, so now you're, you're, you're still back under the natural law, but this, this goes to a, an area that there's no gray areas, but this goes to an area that's not anticipated by Thomas and by others because that boy should be in the house. If, if you're supporting him, you be, should be supporting him in the house. That's the way Thomas would see it. I'm not telling you that. I'm saying that's the way Thomas, that's the way the ancients would have seen it. And why? I mean, I understand. Just however, however that works out, what I'm telling you is you're envisioning a scenario that is not a plan A. So now we're down into plan C, D, E. 
and just realize that, and I'm telling you plan A's, I'm giving you plan A's, realizing that most of us are living plan C, D, E, L, M, N, O, P, but this is why it's breaking down. This is why it's not working. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you have to go back to the ideal. Um, in modern times, the psychologists would say that the teenager's mind isn't done cooking. The rationale is not fully developed until they're like 21, right? So how does that fit in with this? So you started your comment with modern psychologists. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But they think your brain isn't finished developing. Who's they? Well, the medicine, doctors, like medicine also. So is this big pharma medicine that wanted us all jabbed? Is it the same guy? <laughs> so I'm having a problem seeing the credibility. So what I'm getting at is this, is oftentimes we, are, we cite voices which give us an option that are a, a perspective that's inconsistent with our faith. So with regard to modern psychology, you go to um, Leo XIII, who wrote in Aeternus Patris, the centrality and necessity of Thomistic psychology. And what he says about that is for those that are slower developing. What he says is they will follow the path upon which you set them. And what that means, we've heard the variation on it, raise a child in the ways of the Lord and so he will go. And so that's what he says, is, is, is you set him sail, then that's the, that, that's the way he will go. St. Thomas, what he's not saying, but what he's inferring and implying is that the more the world has influence on his development, the less he will follow the straight and narrow. And so this is politically incorrect. But when we talk about homeschool children who are not exposed to the world, they're not socially integrated, all of these things, that is a great attribute, not a defect. If we're going to preserve the faith whole and entire and preserve the faithful, it is the world which militates directly against it. So if you want to preserve purity, if you want to preserve bright perspective, then interaction with the world, there's nothing positive to be gained from that. But that relationship with children, parents, and mind, what can be learned from the example of the wedding at Cana where Jesus was a full-grown 30-year-old man living with his mother, his father was out of the picture, and yet obeyed his mother. Okay, followed, I followed you there until you, you inserted a modernistic interpretation of that gospel. He's not living with her. She's living with him. And that once you insert that, then you understand that once Joseph dies, he's head of household. Exactly my point. But he obeyed her. He obeyed his mother. So what can be learned from her? You mean he obeyed his mother? He, she said, woman, it's not my time. And she's like, no, nah, you're going to do, do whatever he tells you. The misinterpretation of what's happening. So let's go back to the church fathers and let's see what they said about that particular thing. So what he's saying, what she says, first of all, is she does not say they're out of wine, a nice little rosé would be good. She doesn't say that. She simply says they're out of wine. So in this moment, she gives us the understanding that she's relating to him as an equal, not as a child. And then he responds by saying, woman, that word is precisely the word used to refer, uh, that Adam referred to Eve. When God says, where are you? The woman you put here with me. So that woman is exactly the same word. So the exegesis on, on that scripture by the, the early church fathers was, he is saying, woman, all women, it's not yet my time. And then he steps into the role. The passion starts in that moment. And so... He's not relating to her as mother. He's relating her to her then as all women. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what's where do you where do you lose me? Um, I can see the passion like again, but 
maybe the other times as well, but um, how is he relating her to all women with the acceptance of her desire for him? Okay, so this is not her desire for him. We're, in, we're, we're inserting that in. She's playing a role, he's playing a role. Right. And so she's going to have, as Mary, as perfectly conformed to God, she has no desire that's uniquely Mary. Yes, yes. And so, so when we go back, the ancients saw the passion begins here because we've we got to see where it falls in the traditional readings. So we have Epiphany. Right. Then right after the first Sunday after Epiphany, we have Holy Family. And then we have a series, we have Feria Days where we're concentrating on the Holy Family. Not in the liturgy, but in our mind. They're going to Egypt. They're coming back from Egypt. They're setting up the home in Nazareth. And then we have them going to the temple. Jesus remains in the temple. Then we have them coming to Nazareth. And by Friday of that week, which started with Holy Family, Jesus as an adult male is being baptized in the Jordan. Joseph has died somewhere in this progression. So this is, a, this is Epiphany. And then the very next Sunday is Wedding at Cana. It's the first sign. The ancients said that when he works the first sign, the epiphany is continuing to spread. People are finding out who he is. He's becoming more and more obvious. And then as he works his way through the signs, it's going to become patently obvious by the time he raises Lazarus that he is in fact the Christ, the Messiah. So can you interpret um, his response for a woman? What does this have to do with me? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it still is... In so, what the ancient said is he's asking her as all humanity, okay. what does this have to do with me? And then when she gives the words, do what he says, then the Ma Messiah is manifest when you do what he says. It's manifest in you. you. Your flesh now becomes quickened. This is an ongoing realization of the incarnation. And so there's been this march, especially since nativity. And so we see the beautiful child. All of this is wonderful. We're still at a safe distance. He could be that. He may not be that. He's baptized. And then at Cana, he changes the water into the wine. You going to drink it? See what I mean? So by now, where, where repentance all the way leads us up to metanoia, are you going to do what he says? And so that's this... this we're either in conformity with the beginning of the Passion and the realization that He is the Messiah, or we retreat from it. And if we remain skeptical and retreat from it, then He's going to continue to do six more signs in the Gospel of John until the last sign is so in our face, He takes a stinking man and brings him out of the tomb. By then, we can't. there's no safe distance. Does that make sense? So that's what the ancients, that's the way they wrote about this progression that we're going through liturgically and this progression that we're going through internally at the same time. We're coming to a fuller realization. So by the time we get to Palm Sunday, it's either Hosanna or we're gone. You're in one of two places. So, does that make sense? Cool. Other questions on power and authority with regard to adult children? I, I said it. Adults. <laughs> You can't. Right. So, you, you, you can't correct it. So here's, and I think those kind of the answers take us from why to how. How do I now conform to my state in life in light of this perceived defect in my parents? Make sense? Okay. So, there's a couple of ways to do it. I can give you the long-suffering way, and I can give you the Weisenheimer way. You want the Weisenheimer way? That was the one I used. <laughs> and it's tough on both of you. Is asking permission for every single thing. <laughs> every single thing. It illustrates the point. But you have to do it with charity and with love. And it illustrates the point. The other way to do it is to recognize that and in both of these responses you have to give thanks to God. 
Because the defect in your, that you perceive in your parent points out the ideal in the father that you will be. Does that make sense? And so, whatever your parent's disposition is, God chose your parent. This is one of the things He did directly. God who does nothing random chose that conception, that family, that ethnicity, that birth order, that gender, all the way down the list. He chose that specifically. He does nothing random. And if He did that, there's not a why, there's a how. Okay? This is the arena that I landed in. He placed my soul right here. Therefore, how can I turn this into the greatest salvific poten potential? There are weak and tepid souls such as mine who needs the ideal father. There are other tougher, more resilient souls who can undergo the abusive father, the abandonment father, those who do horrible things, and in that see the ideal. But either way, the purpose is served. Does that make sense? So if you look at it in that light, then you can see it doesn't matter where you are, that pursuit of holiness, that movement toward holiness is there. And so the question is not how do I make them be the perfect parent, it is how do I become the perfect son? And in being the perfect son, demonstrate to them or show them. And it may not happen until you have children of your own. Do you have children yet? Okay. Watch this. You never ask a question you don't know the answer to. How many of you in here have children? How many of you said at some point in raising your children, I will never say the things my father said? How many? How many of you have said the things your father said? See what I mean? <laughs> and so... We find ourselves saying the things that our parents said. Hopefully we do better. But often the pressures of life, the load of life, and all of those things that weigh down on mom and dad are unknown to you. And often the desire to control is fear. It is a fear. And so often that's what we do is we seek for tighter control. We clamp tighter rather than letting go. And that's one of the classic mistakes of parenting adult children. But I will tell you that if you have children, the sooner that you transition into the, the filial, the horizontal relationship, out of the vertical relationship, it's a much, much happier life. So we were focusing here on this question here where it was uh, someone who's living in the family sees an imperfect parent and how to work with that. Okay. Suppose that we turn around and we say, okay, here's a parent who has a child who has been emancipated and is living a desolate lifestyle. What do we do in that particular case? Okay, so that's a great question and I like the way you ask it. Um, so it becomes, incidentally today, is today Andrew Corsini? So he's a patron of apostate children. And so he is a, he's a great patron, Andrew Corsini. And so what it amounts to is, it is prayer, but it's a simple prayer. Don't pray to change behavior. We, we often see the behavior and we want to change the behavior. What we have to pray for is the deeper goal, is the salvific goal um, of conversion. And so that's a prayer, is a very simple, short prayer. It is, Lord, let them see themselves as you see them. And let me see them as you see them. And that's it. Don't don't pray the, the change behavior prayer. Ultimately, this is the stature or the position of the prodigal father. And the prodigal father is praying that the boy come to his senses. And that's exactly what happens in the scripture. And he's in the pig pen and he comes to his senses. So that's what you're looking for is that prick of conscience. Just simply that prick of conscience. And then he may or may not make a good decision based upon it. But just keep praying that light of Christ prayer. Now there's a psychological element to this type of warfare. Here's the psychological element. If I use the term projection, do you know what I mean? Alright, so your enemy, the demon, is an incorporeal creature. He's made of intellect and will. He has no corpus. He has no body. And so how does he communicate? He communicates through projection. 
he brings a concept into his intellect and then he wills it out into the cosmos, out into the, the ether. And this is temptation. We supply the image that goes with it because that, that's showing in our brain. So if your brain is full of, your, your intellect your, is full of sacred images, he doesn't have a lot to work with. If it's full of horror movies, he's got a lot to work with. If it's full of pornography, he's got a lot to work with. And so this is a very important thing with regard to sacrificial theology, is if you're making sacrifice, what was one of these um, requirements of the sacrificial victim had to be what? Pure, without blemish. And so we're going to spend a lot of our time in sacrificial theology addressing blemishes that we brought into the vocation and those that we acquired during the vocation, but it's a constant case of, uh, uh, of purification, of purgation, getting rid of these blemishes. Where was I going with that? I lost my train of thought. Anybody remember where I was? Projection. Yeah, thank you. Projection. So projection is, we do it when we pray. So what do we project when we pray? Oh, woe is me. Or, thank you God. Thank you for everything. Whatever's happening, thank you. Are we praying like Daniel in the lion's den in thanksgiving? Or are we praying in terror? Are we praying with worry? Because that's being projected. So that's the intonation. That's, that's the disposition of the prayer. So we have to pray in confidence. We have to pray for the right things, those which things are, that inure to salvation, those things which are consistent with God's will. If we're praying to change people's behavior, that prayer is not going to be answered in a way in which we're going to understand it or we're going to see it. We've got to be praying for conversion, deeper things. So there's a psychological element when you're praying the apostate prayer or the light of Christ prayer. Lord, let them see themselves as you see them. The psychological element of this is you have to have in your head the image of that person when they were in right relationship with God. Not in their depraved current state. Their tatted up, pierced, drug-induced state. That's not what you're projecting. You're projecting the image of them at first communion, baptism, confirmation, when we're at marriage. When were they last in right relationship with God? When were they reconciled with God through the sacraments, through something righteous? That's the image that you see them in constantly. Again, back to that reflection. If this person looks at you in the eye and sees that reflection reflected back, the demon is absolutely disarmed within him. Because that's what he is not prepared to see. Diabolical psychology cannot conceive of a creature willing to suffer for another creature. They're absolutely incapable of understanding that concept. Does that make sense? So projection is, what do we project into the cosmos? Glorified scars, confidence, absolute unshakable faith in God the Father. Are we... Hope in Christ the Son, charity in the Holy Spirit. Is this our spiritual odor? Because that stinks to a demon. He doesn't want to be anywhere around that. So what do we project? Do we project worry, despair? He's interested in that. That's a point of psychological compatibility and he's going to accuse God to you. This demon requires fasting. When does fasting augment prayer in this light of the situation, if you were praying for a son or a child that's been disenfranchised. Um, okay, so when you say, I like it when you guys start with those statements. This demon requires fasting. Yeah. Where'd that come from? Well, when the, the apostles are trying to, to exercise a demon, they can't exercise him. Jesus comes in and says, this one requires prayer and fasting. This one. This demon. So how do you know the one we're talking about is that one? No, I, I, that's, that, that's the question. The question is, when is fasting augmentative to the power of prayer? When would be appropriate to apply it? Okay. It would be appropriate in the situation. So the general, so the general, thank you. So the general emphasis, the general principle is fasting augments prayer. Fasting for an intention that's not requisite with God's will, that's just starvation. And so also fasting how you fast, 
Is, there a, is it part of a regular discipline? Are we mortifying our own pleasures and desires that may help it become apparent to the other person? So prayer is a multi, I mean, fasting is a multiplier, but it has to be done correctly. Now, when Jesus said it, let's see the, saint, the scene. The scene is he has just been up on Mount Tabor. He's just gone through the transfiguration. And he comes down Mount Tabor after having been transfigured. What happens in the transfiguration is there is a theophany and God speaks. Peter hears it. John hears it. And then there's the appearance of Moses and Elijah. You guys remember the scene. So there's something... There's, this is a major endorsement by God the Father of Christ the Son. The Almighty Father is making it clear that I have sent Christ the Son, the second person, for the purpose of salvation. This is, in a military term, this is where he gets his commission. He is commissioned at that point, and it's witnessed. And so there's a perfected relationship between God the Father and Christ the Son. They come down, and what we have is a disordered relationship between a father and a son. You remember the apostles are trying to cast the demon out of this boy? The boy and his father are there. And you, do you remember the dialogue? Paraphrasing, Jesus says, how long has he been this way? The response, since he was a child. And so in that translation, it is essentially he was born this way or since he was very, very young below the age of reason. So if I say child, do you automatically assume that he's below the age of reason? Correctly so. So we intuit that this is a generational sin. This is a generational demon. This is a generational demon that is afflicting the boy, the child. And then his father says, um, it throws him into the fire, these things. And then he says, remember his prayer? We get one of the most powerful spiritual warfare prayers out of this exchange. He, Jesus says, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. And he's talking about to the man. And fasting has to do with mortification. Because the generational spirit is going to be affirmed through some type of deviant use of flesh. So to mortify the flesh by fasting, addresses these calls of the flesh down in these lower faculties. Disordered pleasures. Does that make sense? And so then Jesus says, O ye of little faith. The man's response, I believe, help my unbelief. Is this not a petition for greater faith? This is a petition straight to God the Father that goes right back up Mount Tabor. It goes right back up to God the Father. So, this gives you that template for that flow of grace. Does that make sense? Good. So fasting does augment, but the mortification of our desires, put another way, you got to have skin in the game. Because if all we're willing to do is wring our hands five or ten minutes a day and say a prayer, what do we got in it? What are we willing to do? The primary objective of that the question he had was that disenfranchised youth, whether that would be beneficial for him. And you're said, you said the generational spirit might be causing that youth to be disenfranchised from God. I didn't say that. Well, My mention that. of the generational spirit is in response to your, where is the place of fasting? Right. And so fasting has a place. Um, again, it's to be done privately, but more often than not, it, it works, fasting works more on us and the quality and merit of our prayer. Our, our prayer and, and desire becomes much, much purer. Does that make sense? It helps you get from trying to change behavior to salvation. When you said that um, it's just starving yourself if it gets against God's will, isn't God's will for everyone to be saved? So in order, like say a child has left the faith, if I'm fasting and, and along with my um, prayers to bring that child back to my faith, isn't that efficacious? Or no? So you're praying for prick of conscience. And so if fasting helps purify your prayer, then it inures to salvation. But if we say, if I go down to 500 calories a day, 
then my son will come back. Now we're into formulaic superstition. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, um, you know fasting, uh, um, you know, for that special intention. Like, say you, you do um, three months away from having your drink at night, you know. Um, so you want to put that towards your prayers to bring that child back home into the faith. So here's the danger. Is it may have benefit but here's the danger. If at the end of three months he's not back, what do you do? Um, continue praying or maybe add another type of fast or something. That's what I would do. So if I'm the demon, I'm going to tell you, you know, your drink, that was probably pretty good, but you got to get your husband to quit his. Then you got to get your neighbors. Then you got to get all these other people. You see how it works? So... Even a good, what appears to be a good thing, it has to be absolutely purely driven. How do you make sure it's purely driven? You go up chain authority. And if you do fasting under obedience, you're safe. So you go to your pastor, you go to your priest, you go to your spiritual director and you say, here's what I'm wanting to do. Or you go to your husband who's the spiritual director in your house. He's the spiritual head of your house. Here's what I'm wanting to do is may I do that? And then the prudent thing is you may do it for 40 days and then let's see where we are. But the, the change of behavior in the child is not going to be the test because you may not see the interior movements of conversion. Okay, so pursuing this a little bit, there are various devotions out there, uh, primarily coming from Mary and the problem scattered and so forth. There's another one like offering which addresses this particular thing. There are five different promises according to what this nun, who was initially unknown, who now is known apparently, um, and one of them, the third one, says, if you do this, you offer to me all your prayers, works, joys, and sufferings, your masses, etc., whatever, the third one is, none of your children will taste the fires of hell. Where does that fit in all of this? Okay, so it's a great question. Where does it fit in spiritual warfare? Danger, danger, Will Robinson. That's where it fits in. Because this is an area where the demon really wants you to go into private revelation. And so all the great mystics, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, all of them said, you must discount private revelation and seek God in the ordinary, not in the extraordinary. Uh, even if this has a... Um, uh, the, I don't know the right word is apostolic blessing, but it has a, 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 a bishop has proved this as a uh, valid... Uh, principle, principle remains the same. Okay. And so what the demon wants to do is get you drawn out of the ordinary into the extraordinary and, and practicing devotion upon top of devotion upon top of devotion and you get this angst, you get now the worry comes in, am I doing enough, is this really a right promise? And so we can't rely on any of the private revelation. Every possession case we've ever had Every single one had two features. One feature was there was a defect in Marian dogma. There was at least one of the Marian dogmas that was de in defect. And that may be the addition of a false dogma. And so Mary would be the last to make a guarantee. Stop and think about it. She's, she's going to be the last to make a guarantee. We go back to the wedding in Cana. That's the template of Marian intercession. She brings the problem to Christ and He will either act on it or He will not. And so Mary's not going to guarantee anything. So that's a big red flag. Um, and so that's, the, um, that's number one reason uh, or that we see the other one that we see is every single case there is false mystical phenomenon. As the demon starts to lose grip, he will give them emotional consolations and false mystical phenomenon. Various insights, various elements of occult knowledge, various things which uh, are... The goal is to get them to withdraw from the prayer. And so every one of the possession cases has had those two features. temptation for Catholics to sort of put Mary in that position as like, you know, pray to her and she'll solve everything kind of thing for you and 
like the prayers that he talks about, you know, these as a convert, I'm like, oh, yay, you know. So here's the thing is if there's a guarantee, what happens to faith? And, and so you just look at it as functional theology. Yeah, I mean, people, to recognize who she is and what she is in the, all the cosmos is powerful enough. To put something else on that ultimately would militate against faith. And this is the same with regard to fasting. Is the church fathers said that anything that has a potential to militate against faith, hope, and charity in any way that becomes formulaic, you need to avoid that. So my question is, with the rosary and the 15 promises of Mary, how does this fit in with what, what you're... I think you read the promises as revealed to St. Dominic, uh -huh. but you've got to go back into that. Mary doesn't guarantee anything. Uh -huh. She essentially says, if you pray this, these things will happen to you through praying this. Okay. And if you pray the rosary every day for a year, I'll guarantee you, you're going to be different than you were at the beginning of the year. Yeah. You're not going. She doesn't promise that it will have a cosmic effect on someone else, right. because I mean, functionally in the revelation that is was mentioned a while ago, suppose one of those sons is an is an avowed Satanist and wants to give his life to Satan, and and has an abject hatred for God. Saint Thomas very simply says, you cannot will the action of another. You can't impose your will on another, and so functionally, if he made that decision then by the interpretation of that promise or that divine revelation his will would be overrode and he would be dragged kicking and screaming into heaven yeah. see i mean you have to look at it from that perspective does that make sense yeah. yes. okay so now let's go to sacrificial theology and some functional things what are, how are we doing for time oh <laughs> I don't want anyone to stay out of a sense of obligation. I'd like to, to introduce a couple of concepts if you want to stay, and then we can go for questions, and I'm willing to stay as long as you would like, um, within, reason, within reason. But here are the concepts. All of us are engaged in vocation. And so to understand that vocation, married or religious life, is spousal gift of self. And so let's, let's identify or define some terms with regard to sacrificial theology. Does everyone understand that when you pursue vocation, you are giving yourself to God? Okay. It's, it's surprising the number of people who don't. And so is there a difference between giving yourself to God without reservation and agreeing to serve God? Trick question alert. Is there a difference between giving yourself without reservation in spousal union to God and, and agreeing just to serve God? Yes. Will God accept the latter? No. no. He will not. Because it's an imperfect gift. It's an imperfect gift. And so a lot of us are on the edge of spousal union or we want it on our terms. Does that make sense? Yep. And so it's an, imperfect, it's an imperfect charity. It's an imperfect participation in salvation. It's an imperfect relationship because we're doing it on our own terms. And so let me ask you this. If I, if I bring up the idea of uh, the marital debt, or the spousal debt. How many of you think that is solely related to uh, marriage? Could you explain spousal debt? Sure. So the spousal debt is to make yourself available to the, the other person, the, to the spouse. There's a contractual relationship and you, have con you exchange contractual rights over each other's body in marriage. Are those same rights exchanged in religious orders? Yes. 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 This, and so we get a modern departure from this because a lot of priests and a lot of marrieds want to start putting stipulations or restrictions on that spousal exchange. So for the priest, is there such a thing 
as consensual sex? No. Can't be. Because it's inconsistent with his spousal contract with God. Do you see? It's a totality. It's a totality. And so it, it's a totality of purity, chastity, all of these things from the intellect all the way down. And there's an absolute necessity to maintain that purity. We talk about St. Joseph and we like to call him terror of demons. Where did his power come from? Purity. His purity. Tradition always held it that he was a celibate man. Living a celibate life. He was in the sand. That was his spirituality. And now he's called out of that vow to be husband to Mary. And she's called out of a perpetual vow of virginity to be mother of Jesus. Those vows are intact. And they're kept intact. So marital debt, the, the, um, the obligation to make yourself physically available to the vocation. What does that look like for Father? It means that when his bishop calls him up and says, I want you to go from here to there. I want you to move. I, want you, I need you to say these three masses at this location. Then he's rendering that obligation because he's making himself physically available to go and do what he does in this place. Does that make sense? So Bernard of Clairvaux talked about us as marrieds we have two spousal obligations to render marital debt. One is to the marriage and the other is to Christ and they can't be inconsistent. They cannot be inconsistent. So are you ready to go to the politically incorrect sensitive area? Alright, so let's go there. With regard to the conjugal act, it is the most attacked and assailed area in our faith. Why? In the second chapter of Genesis, God speaks to Adam and Eve saying, Go forth and multiply. Subdue the earth, bringing it under your dominion. So the go forth and multiply, He's speaking to who? Second Genesis. There's only two people in the world. Okay, how come you named Adam first? Exactly. Do you guys see this? Yeah. So are Adam and Eve equal? No, no. no. They're different. It doesn't mean that one is of less value or a diminution of the other. It means that the sum is greater than the parts. Yeah. And so this idea of equality is not a Catholic concept. It's a modern concept that militates exactly against our roles because they are very different and one can't be discharged without the other but there is a an order so when he says to Adam and Eve go forth and multiply subdue the earth bringing it under your dominion so if you've got let's just say for, for argument how many of you have got more than one child alright you've got an older child younger child you tell the older child, go do this thing and take the younger one with you. Who's responsible? So when God speaks to Adam, who's responsible? Who's responsible for the integrity of going forth, multiplying and subduing the earth, bringing it under your dominion? Who's responsible? Precisely. Now do you see the first sin of Adam? So it's the same in the household. This is something to understand. The sins of the household are the responsibility of whom? The father. The husband. Do you see it? Say again. I said no pressure, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so why women would you want that equality? <laughs> but when you see it, you see it clearly. Now when he says, go forth and multiply, to whom is he giving the responsibility of the, uh, for the purity, the frequency, and the fecundity of the marital act, of the conjugal act? Who bears that responsibility? The man and the husband. So one of the, the 
punishments under sin was, and your desire will be for your husband. Do you remember that? And so that means your desire will be to control. Your desire will be to be over. And what that means modernly is most in most marriages, the conjugal act, its frequency, its fecundity is decided by whom? The woman. Do you see the disorder? So let's continue down this path. When's the last time you heard with regard to natural family planning, any form of birth regulation? When was the last time you heard the very simple adage, stop doing it? Never. It works 100% of the time it's tried. Abstinence is 100% effective in controlling the frequency of children born in a marriage. Do you know that? Not 99%. 100%. We all, you were looking for that guarantee a while ago? There's the guarantee. But do you see how far we've gotten? And now, let's make it even a little bit more politically incorrect. Because the demon is in the details. He's going to be where you make the excuses to go into the lower faculties. When you go into the lower faculties, I'd be willing to bet that other than to consummate the marriage, very few people engage in the conjugal act out of intellect and will for the sole purpose of giving, giving glory to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that you know, when you look at that, then it, it's, it's kind of a shock. But we mostly engage in it out of the lower faculties. But if it's the conjugal act for the purposes of reconciliation, of celebration, That's a misuse of the act. That's a seeking of emotional consolation versus spiritual consolation. And it's a misuse of the act. And so if the demon can get you to misuse the act, then he's going to constantly prey on that act around the periphery. Pornography, self-image, all of these things. He's going to constantly be in that work on that margin, on that periphery. And you're going to be susceptible to that. So if you regulate Pius IX, how many people know what Pius IX is famous for? Which was? The syllabus of errors. errors, Which was? Yep. So what else did he do? Uh, Yep. Exactly. Immaculate conception. He did something else that we, we don't think about. Pius IX was all about this particular error, uh, area. What he did before he did the Immaculate Conception is he listed an infallible statement that said, life begins at conception. That's Pius IX. That's Pius IX. So if you want a patron saint of the unborn, if you want a patron saint against abortion, against all these things, it's Pius IX. The same guy who gave us Immaculate Conception. And so it was necessary for him five years before Immaculate Conception to say life begins at conception because now you've defined conception and its connection to life. Then five years later we get the dogma of Immaculate Conception. Do you see this progression? And so he was all over, all about the sanctity of the conjugal act And up until the Petrine Code of 1917, Raymond of Pinafort, everybody, when they talked about the Conjugal Act, they listed two purposes. They listed two purposes. Procreative and unitive. Which one's listed first? Why do you think it's listed first? So, as St. Thomas says, there's a ranking in all things. There's a primacy in all things. And the purpose of the conjugal act within, and it, the conjugal act being defined rightly done is inside the confines of sacramental marriage. The sacrament of matrimony. Its primary purpose is procreation. So any use of it that does not satisfy that primary use is de facto a misuse. You see it? 
Relax, we've all been doing it wrong. <laughs> Again, plan A, we're living plan C, D, E, F, G, element O, P. But to see what plan A is and see what it, that's where there's absolutely no um, opportunity for the demon to be there because your will is in perfect conformity to God's will. Now, to the extent we depart that ideal, that plan A, we are vulnerable to influence. Yeah. Well, all you have to do is just be open to life, though. Right? All you have to do is to be open to life. Right. I mean, it's just, it pretty, seems pretty simple. I mean, you know, you, I mean, you don't have to make a big issue out of it. You just, in your mind, have to be open to life, right? So there's a difference between being open to life and avoiding ovulation. Yeah. You're, oh, you're talking about NFP. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. And, and so if, I, if we engage in the act and the, the primary purpose is procreation and we're purposely frustrating the primary purpose, do you see where we're open now to the influence of the adversary? Yeah. And all I'm saying is this is about spiritual warfare. All I'm saying is you're going to defend what you did when you come up against the, when, you, when you come before the Sacred Heart at particular judgment and look into his eyes, we all get an opportunity to explain why we did what we did. I'm going to be saying mercy, mercy, mercy. I know, right? But the idea is we've got to defend whatever it is we do. And so natural family planning in most cases is a misuse because we're timing the conjugal act purposely not to be procreative. And if you're doing, looking at it that way, what is the right response? The holy response is to regulate the frequency of the act. So if you want one child every five years, that's the frequency with which you can do the act. Mm -hmm. um, if you're the woman, doesn't this guilt fall on the husband? Excellent. Yeah. It precisely. Yeah. And so you are protected by, you are protected by obedience. But you, you see what I mean? Yeah. And so when you look at this, these are areas that we become vulnerable to the adversary. And it, it starts to skew sacrificial theology because what he wants to do is he wants to take you out of that flow of grace that flows through the altar of sacrifice. He wants to take you out of that flow of grace and move you over incrementally so that you're outside the flow of grace so that the, the, the altar of your marriage becomes a, a spot of depravity, not a spot of sacrifice. That it becomes the locus of depravity, not the locus of sacrifice. It can be the locus of self-sacrifice when you do not engage in the act. It is the management of the act, stewardship of the act, that's where holiness is found. Does that make sense? Okay. Hi. I fought natural family planning. I fought marriage prep. I fought with um, Eric Waters in his. Anyway, this whole idea is if you want to have fam uh, children every two years, have sexual intercourse once every two years. That is not found anywhere in any of the things that I've ever read. What's the problem? I can't tell you. All I can tell you is that's the vulnerability that's being exploited is the idea that we can engage in the conjugal act for purposes other than which it was attended and we can do it with impunity. We cannot. It begins to work on the integrity of the marriage. It works on the integrity of these things. And so the big takeaway that I want to, to, to get away here is remember we're talking spiritual warfare. And so the demon doesn't want to possess you, the husband, individually. He doesn't want to possess the wife individually. He wants to possess the marriage. He wants to possess the one flesh union. Because that's the sacrifice that's being offered in its purity to God. That's the value. That's the cosmic value that's being offered to God is the pure marriage. And so he's looking at any way he can to diminish it or to take it out of, outside the flow of grace. So when a husband's tempted to infidelity, the demon's not after the husband. He's after the marriage. So I've heard this before. It's just that it never struck me, I guess, because of everything that I've read, everything that I was encouraged to go out and to teach, uh, even going out with a priest who's as orthodox as a day long. It's always like, you know, um, you don't have to have children like rabbits. <laughs> 
what never gets to the point that you've just explained. And this dear priest, who's a spiritual father in my family, he is as orthodox as a day long, so I'll have to chat with him about this. So what's happens, what happens is, is we conform ourselves to the norms of society. Right, right. And Pius IX had no concern about the norms of society. Thomas Aquinas had no concern about the norms of society. Holy is holy. Holy is timeless. It, gets, it may get more difficult in certain areas, um, in certain epic times, but holiness is holiness. It's not, it's not graded on a curve. Right. I, I'm going to need a reference material of this in writing. Does Father Bernard have anything that would be helpful in his book or anything? So why are you going to need that? My husband. Ah. So you're going to go home and beat him up with this? No. <laughs> no. Um, bring him to listen to Father Ripperger and ask some specific questions. And then you can find elsewhere the development within the canon law, Petrine Code to Modern Code, with regard to the purposes of the Conjugal Act. And so modernly what we see is we see procreative and unitive now has been switched in the 84 code. It actually says unitive and procreative. And so we've also got, gotten some movement with regard to, well, capital punishment. We've gotten movement with regard to the spiritual works of mercy. There's been some movement within those numbers. Um, all of these things, Pius the nine, uh, Pius the sixth, not Pius the sixth, John the sixth, when he wrote Humani Vitae, he opens the door to the understanding that um, family planning is some, to engage in the conjugal act in non-fertile periods is somehow okay. Yes, he, yes. He, that's where he opens that. Yes. And so you just have to see that that's inconsistent with 19 centuries of teaching. It's inconsistent with how these things were first proposed and then how they developed. And so when you've got Pius IX, who is the authority on this area, he wrote more eloquently than anybody, and settle these questions with regard to conception, the Immaculate Conception, wouldn't you want to go back to him and say, if he definitively addressed this, what did he say? And then why are we not still bound to it? So, taking that thing, uh, you just said here, Paul the Sixth and you know the details. I've heard it said that this is what it is, and um, you cannot eat these from this. So that when we as modern Catholics, I mean, uh, in the 60s, I was just graduating from college. And that's all I've ever heard, even as a, you know, an adult or whatever. And, you know, so many people are challenging me in my Vitae. say, well, hey, I'm going to be a loyal Catholic. I want to go along with my Vitae. And so, you know, it's, you can use the infernal time. You don't have to get, have intercourse every time, just when you want to have a child, you know. It's like... This whole concept, like I said, I've seen so it let's before, take it. I've heard it. It's just incongruous with everything post humanity. So let's take this So let's take this one step further. And so first of all, what I'm saying is operatively is many people are exactly where you are. And we're seeing and we're seeing and we're seeing that functionally it does not provide protection against the demon. Yes. That's the point that I'm making, is it does not provide functional protection against the diabolical. And so if the diabolical are being allowed, then we have to go back and say, okay, where did we get this wrong? Does that make a sen make yeah, sense? Absolutely. I, I understand. Um, I understand. How does this, what if, like, say the woman is infertile for some reason? I mean, it's not going to be procreative unless medicine steps in in some way. Or maybe you're not even then, someone who can't even help medicine you know, and stay within Catholic doctrine. So, how does, how does that? Okay, so there are those, and you bring up a very, very good point. So, but I'm, I, this is in answering your question. Let's retreat back for just a moment and look at what would move a rightly ordered, sanctified, holy marriage to engaging in the conjugal act. It is that for the purpose of procreation, Essentially, there has to be this disposition that our love for each other as spouses is our love for God. We cannot contain it within us, and therefore we're going to bring forth more sacrifice for God. So it's literally done for the glory of God to bring forth a child 
for the glory of God. Do you, do you see that motivation? That is so far above functional humanity. Now back to your question. If you engage in the conjugal act and there's no possibility of procreation, that act and that marriage may be open to diabolical influence, diabolical affliction. Pray before, pray after, sanctify the act as much as you can, but you've got to answer for that. I'm not telling you not to do it. You understand what I'm saying? Please understand. I'm not telling you not to do that. What I'm saying is, we all engage in activities that are open to diabolical influence. When you turn on CNN, you're opening yourself up to diabolical influence because there's going to be an emotional appeal. I don't know about you, but I'm not tough enough to watch CNN without an emotional response. And so we, we, open, we, we are all engaging in various areas and activities where the demon is right there. So this is not the only one. And I'm not telling you not to do these things. Well, it's, it's just, just to kind of maybe clarify my point a little bit, it's something might be physically wrong with the woman from birth. It's not like she purposely had a hysterectomy or something. I understand. But it's, she went into the marriage like that. I understand. And, and you may, what I'm saying is pray. And the prayer may some, be something along the lines, Lord, please permit this unitive, this unitive act and keep it free from the diabolical, keep it free from perversion, and may our love for each other be a manifestation of our love for you. Those kind of prayers, that's going to send the demon packing. That's going to get him away. But the more you descend down into the base faculties of lust and desire, the more open that act is to the diabolical. So, uh, is, 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 this, is this something that you're... you're like, like you're, you're tallying on the databases? Yep. That's what I was thinking. Okay, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm speaking straight out of database stuff. We got, there are, a, yeah, there's a world of marriages that are under attack at the obsession level and it is the profanation of the conjugal act by degree which is allowing the demon to affect the marriage. And so that's, this is not opinion, this is simply, this is what we're seeing. Okay, so to go back to the situation, Suppose we're talking about a woman who has not had a hysterectomy, so it's physically not possible, but for some reason, whatever, uh, she's infertile, uh, and the man might be infertile, etc. We, we don't know, okay, unless they go do some medical tests. But suppose that they go into the marital act, hoping that God will bless that act in the same way he blessed um, Sarah and Abraham, and the same way he blessed many other people. Same, same way he way. blessed Anna and Joachim. Yes, right. Same way. So that in that particular case, I don't see where that would be. Simple. That is absolutely not. That is open to procreation, open to children. Yeah. That it, and that's that's how that language is properly used. Right, right. And so you're not there's always a possibility for a miracle. There's always that possibility. So we're still going to make it about procreation right. and about allowing God to work in that sanctified space. Right. That's always and everywhere a safe, safe ground, so to speak. Yeah. Tough spot, tough area. Que other questions? Yes. Okay, so let's go back. Let's clean up the language a little bit. Let's get Thank you. Me. Let's get you into the flow of grace Thank in your thought and in your work, in your deed. So first of all, 
you've got a whole list of people scripturally starting with Samson's mother, Hannah, all of these people were either barren, past childbearing age, right. and they had children. So you never can say not open to the miracle. Okay, you, you never can say not open to the miracle. You never can say not open to the miracle. Jesus cured the man born blind. And so, you can't, and now, now let's clean up another thought. Is God is not going to send you a man for you to have. He'll send you for a man to have you. Yep, that one's going to be a tough one. Who came first, Adam or Eve? Adam. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. I just, I want to grow in God. Okay, so here's what you do. Okay. You pray, okay. Lord, I pray for Mr. Wright. I pray that I am misright so that he may recognize me. Yes. And if you pray that way, then you're, you're more open to the grace, you're more open to the union. Now the conjugal act is going to be necessary to consummate the marriage. And so this is a, is, this is a consummating act. This is that gift of self to man that is manifestation of your gift of each other to God. Yes. And so the conjugal act is going to be necessary to consummate the marriage. And so as long as you're thinking along those lines, then you're going to be a lot more recognizable to Mr. Wright. So, I mean, it's, that would be a, that, that's, a, that's acceptable. That's a good thing. And so, please understand, I'm not telling you what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. What I'm telling you is, this opens you up to the diabolical. This will not open you up to the diabolical. So, if that, and that's... I'm not telling you what's a sin and what's not a sin. Right, right. Please don't take it that way at all. I'm just saying, you know, it, it's like a coach who's telling you if you continue to throw the ball like that, your shoulder is going to be, is going to hurt. Yeah. You can certainly continue to do that. And you can take your major league career and turn it into two years versus 20 years. Yeah. That's all I'm saying is, is that's our experience and what we're seeing if people do these things as we're working backwards from possessed marriages or oppressed, obsessed marriages, these are the defects that we're finding. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And, and I'll add that I had said here, and you said early on about not being comfortable in speaking and that sort of thing. And I smiled to myself because I thought, if you only knew how I sat here and said, Lord, if you would just give me the ability to articulate like you're doing, I, I would I'm a willing vessel. I, I would take it. Oh, be careful. To be <laughs> to get oh, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I see that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But but it is Thank conjugal you. is not <laughs> simply just to procreate. It has to be open to that. It has to be for that purpose. That purpose may not be realizable. Okay. And so I'm really parsing language out because it, it, it has everything to do with the way that you are mentally and spiritually disposed. Okay. I would think you've had a, probably a wide range of sexual dysfunction in our society, period. So the stuff that you're seeing in these diabolical I don't know how many would equate to Catholics that are living in a state of grace, at least trying to, um, and living together as husband and wife. I mean, that might be a, a little avenue, but I'm just speaking, but how, how many of those have you seen? Quite, quite a few, and, and so some, it's a good question. So some similarities that those have is an outside influence coming in, um, such as, um, the societal emphasis on the conjugal act among middle-aged men. There's a great societal pressure, cultural pressure on middle-aged men to engage in the act and be capable of engaging in the act. So, incidentally, did you know there was, a, there was an unforeseen side effect with uh, Viagra? There, no, there's been a 90% increase in headaches in women over 60. <laughs> 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 
open the door for that one. <laughs> the, the point being is there's a huge cultural uh, pressure on men to um, be sexually active later than um, maybe normal or even doable. I guess by other men, huh? <laughs> Not by women. <laughs> well, it's... it's uh, do you know how we laugh about Viagra, but it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Yeah. All the pharmaceuticals, all the hair dyes, all the stuff that's requisite with, and then on the women, it works on the women on the other side to look uh, age inappropriate to, to have certain attributes that are emphasized, that are inconsistent with a matron life. The matron life is a matriarchal life, patriarchal life. That's a huge power. But if I can get a patriarch, demon speaking here, if I can get a patriarch to wear his ball cap backwards, open his shirt to his navel, wear gold chains and baggy pants, and I can get a matriarch to wear age and weight inappropriate clothing, what have I just done to that state of life? This, is, this militates directly against decorum and understanding who we are and the magnitude of rightly occupying your state in life. So the other observation is we've had uh, multiple cases of possession of a marriage where both men and, men and women are looking at pornography. Both the husband and the wife are looking at pornography to, quote, spice up the marriage. And they both become possessed. The marriage is possessed. So yeah, that wouldn't happen to two folks that are trying to be... Uh so the term spice it up doesn't occur theologically yeah and so they, they they end up doing things in the bedroom they think they're covered but they're doing things that a first century pagan wouldn't even think about and they're they're doing that as if it's somehow permissible because it's happening in the confines of marriage and it's not marriage does not sonate perversion it doesn't make uh, it doesn't make holy that which is perverted that's surely understandable. We have an end that yeah. So we, we we are seeing those cases. Any more? There's mud. Penny. Mm -hmm. um, how do you approach? And this is, I feel like everything else has been so deep, and this is just maybe a silly question. How do you approach people who have, you know, maybe gotten a divorce and then remarry, um, you know, without, you know, the proper channels and maybe they're in, do you associate with those people? You know, it's, it always is, I find a sticky situation. I just have a few relationships that I know that it's like, you know, you know they're... So even though it's a wild and unbelievable hypothetical that you present to this group, <laughs> we'll entertain it. Um, so the first thing is, is to remember that the, there is an order to the spiritual works of mercy. And so to, re, to think about, first of all, the relationship, the friendship, is it one that is primarily of a spiritual nature? nature? It is the desire for the spiritual good of the other. If it passes that test, then you continue on and the spiritual works of mercy start with to counsel the doubtful and instruct the ignorant. Now, those may be changed, but they're one and two. Okay. We always want to skip to three, which is admonish the sinner. Mm -hmm. We want to go stand on necks mm -hmm. and tell them where they're wrong. Mm -hmm. But the, the, um, the safe statement is always, this is inconsistent with our faith. Mm -hmm. and, and so, are you aware that this is inconsistent with our faith? Okay. And then, do you want to be consistent with our faith? Right. Right. Because they may well not. And so you always give them the out. You always give them that. And so do you want this thing? And they may well say no. If they say yes, now you can really instruct the ignorant. You can say, okay, here is what you got to do. Incidentally, is you don't have to obtain the annulment for grace to now begin to flow. Grace flows through subjection to authority. So when they start the process and subject themselves to the process, grace starts to flow. With that grace comes a clarity and, an, and a strength to act. Okay. Um, so if they're Catholic and 
I don't mean to put you in this spot, but you've got things like Amoris Laetitia that make things even more confusing, mm -hmm. where there are divorced and remarried Catholics that are like, oh, we're good now, you know, and they're going and receiving Holy Communion and, you know, maybe not even going to confession, perhaps, and they think they're good as gold. How, that's a difficult thing to... Okay, so two things. One is that light of Christ prayer is a universal weapon. Lord, let them see themselves as they see them and let me see them as you see them. And then it's the simple statement, this is inconsistent with 19 centuries of our faith and the teaching that has all come before. And, and so this is just simply inconsistent with our faith. And, and then you say, and that's why it causes me angst. Because it may not be causing them angst. And so you say, this is inconsistent with our faith, and that's why it's causing me angst. And so if they have a concern for you, now they may act or not act. But either way you've discharged, you now have a clean conscience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is that? letters, which are part of our doctrinal faith. Right. And you've gone back and compared them with, with the last so many centuries and said they're you have to look at this and not this, but everything is, is congruent here because our faith is, that's the way our faith is. Everything is congruent. So it's not congruent if you're doing that. So how do you reconcile it? No, so I'm going to take exception to the way you say that. Okay. Because that's what we're pointing out is the incongruity. Is, is if I go 19 centuries developing a concept and then in 50 years I get a statement that's inconsistent with this development, mm. that's the incongruity. That's yeah. But it can't exist. It can't exist. It can't exist in our faith. It has to be congruent. You can't have doctrines that are incongruent. Well, we do. We can't. We that, do. That would be a, a falsehood of our entire faith. No, no, it doesn't falsify the whole thing. If if you one is wrong, then the rest are going to be proven. Can be proven. It's a spurious. It's a spurious. It's a. It's a spurious argument, sir, because the weight of evidence leads us to here. And then if we have a false piece, does not negate that which came before. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're saying at some point in the future it will be corrected and we'll be back to congruity. That's the way it works. And so what happens is, is you get a movement, then there is a her heresy that develops, and then there's a council or a dogmatic statement that addresses the heresy. That's the way it's always worked. So we go back and we look at, so here we go, is we're going along with all the doctrine that has to do with communion, annulments, marriage, all of this, and we get this Amoris Laetitia, and then we go along, and then a hundred years from now when we get the next council, they look back and they say, this is what's inconsistent, and they remove it. Arianism was this close to becoming doctrine, this close to becoming dogma, and there was even a, a papal statement on Arianism. The majority of the clerics were Arians. And now it's, it was corrected by uh, Nicaea. But that's the way it went. Is there, it was all this way. And then you have this errant statement. And only in hindsight, by looking back, do we see this is not consistent with all that came. Can you give one example where that has happened historically, where we have corrected a uh, encyclical that came out with something definitively and it was overturned? I just gave it. Arianism. Council of Nicaea 321 corrected. It corrected the heresy of Arianism. Athanasius in the east, Hilary of Pointers in the west, both of them wrote definitive documents. The council said this is a definitive answer. Out of that we get the um, Athanasian Creed. And so that's a classic example. And there are multiple examples. Trent settled several questions. First Vatican Council settled several questions and cited Thomas's writings as the definitive answer and said that's settled. And then you're going to get a pope or somebody who's going to make a statement that's inconsistent. It's only in hindsight do you say, okay, that's inconsistent, therefore that's not a binding under, under penalty of sin. I mean, that's the way we, that we keep it clean. That's the way we've always done it. We're constantly hopeful. I mean, the gates of hell will not prevail. I mean, there will be all these errors that will be determined they, these are errors. 
But the, the real important part is Amoris Laetitia doesn't affect any, well, I shouldn't say any, it doesn't affect me personally. Unless I pick it up and now I use it as a source of angst. And I want to, now that's, the, that's not the hill I want to die on. Oh. Yes, Father. Well, you may have answered it. But, uh, I was going to say, why, what if you know that something's inconsistent, not through hindsight, you can read and you see it. Right. And it comes out, I mean. So again, and that, it, it's an excellent point. So will you know it to be inconsistent with morals and doctrine? And if you follow it thinking you are going to be protected, you will not. It, if, you, uh, follow that, if you follow that deviancy, knowing it's a deviancy, thinking you will pre be protected, you will not. If, however, you are ignorant and you follow that, you will be protected. And so this is the function of, of this is functional obedience. Again, the test is, is it against morals and doctrine? So if your bishop says something, you don't abide by what he says, you're not following the obedience of your oath to office. And that's, that's counter to what's being written. You've got to follow one or the other. The bishop says, do this, you're supposed well, to do this. So, first of all, and we talked about this yesterday, so let's go back and let's dig this horse up and beat him some more. Because we did severely beat him yesterday. So, obedience is the understanding that I am bound under penalty of sin to do this thing. It's not that your bishop suggests you do this. That does not require obedience. There has to be a clear statement that you are bound under penalty of sin to do this thing. Therefore, if you don't do this thing, it is sin. That's the, that's the level of obedience. Obedience in concept is misapplied constantly by the modern cleric. And it's used as an, in an emotional way and in a guilt-ridden way. And we see it all, all up and down the scale, which is if you had love for your fellow man, you would get the vaccine. It's a spurious statement. It's a spurious statement. And so, first of all, is to understand, am I required, the moral theologian would say, am I required, do I have an obligation, and does it bind under penalty of sin? And so reduce that argument to there. And then you realize that the bishops often exceed their power, canonically often exceed their power. And so to do that and to claim obedience is not going to afford you protection. Mm -hmm. Let's explain this. So if a bishop asks you to do something and you know that it's not right, you don't have to do it. That's what you're saying. That's correct. If you know it's against morals and doctrine. Should, is it appropriate to clarify is it under penalty of sin no you don't so so the right response so the right response is let's say your bishop uh, issues this statement I would highly recommend and I would very much exhort you to get the um, the COVID vaccine so as you listen to that does that command obedience no no if he says, I order you, do you hear the language difference? So this is the way the modern cleric and others take an emotional approach to obedience. That you would do this if you were obedient. We have all been 14 years old. We know what conscriptive language sounds like and what it doesn't sound like. So, um, touching back on the disorders based on the Sixth and Ninth Commandment, um, a lot of Catholics are starting to model uh, sort of recovery programs based on the 12-step program. Do you see any spiritual dangers with those? I'm not familiar program? enough with them. Okay. And I'm not seeing them in our data set. Mm -hmm. I, I'm vaguely aware of them, but I can't speak to them. Okay. <clears throat> Under this diabolical disorientation that we're all living through, yeah. does yeah. the <laughs> continuity, or does a hermeneutic of continuity mm -hmm. have a place to play in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's kind of what this gentleman was touching on up here, if I understood it. So the, the, the hermeneutic of continuity was ruptured in Vatican II, and it's only getting worse. Um, and so to understand that, I mean, that's a simply an observational statement, because we're getting uh, possession cases of clerics, possession cases of priests, obsession pr cases of priests, who have been operating under certain presumptions and certain documents that have come out of Vatican II, 
and they haven't been afforded diabolical protection from those activities. When we allow people, and we've been ordaining people that, well, I don't know that, but um, I think he's very observant. I mean, and that's the point that is people are make people make observations, and that continuity was ruptured, and it and it continues to. Um, that hernia continues to grow, if you will, that, that deviancy. And it's going to continue to grow until it becomes so absurd that there's not another council is called or there is a division. We're almost there now with some apostasy we're living through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yep, and it's not the first time we've been here. No, it's not. And so the demon, you just look at how did the demon behave before? He's behaving this now. He's, he's fueling and driving this rush toward chaos. Yep. Being that it seems like we're all pretty aware that things are very confusing and there's so much lack of clarity, um, I think oftentimes myself, dear friends, people I go to church with, there's this feeling of this futility, like, you know, angst yeah. and, well, what do we do with this and what do we do with that? And so, um, I'm thinking your answer is going to be not why, but how. <laughs> yeah. So we really need to just accept these are the times that we're in and how are we going to be saying Not to accept them, embrace them, grab them, because providentially you're here, I'm here. So God said that. So that being said, now let's get out of the confusion. You do that by getting to the high ground of intellect and will. And you make statements like this is inconsistent with everything that went before. And there's not, a, there's not a doctrine, there's not a principle that will reconcile these things that are inconsistent. That's why that errant letter is going to stick up like that. And so you, you can't build a construct around that and make it consistent with this which has come before. And that's always been the failure of the modernist and relativist is they draw an inconsistent conclusion. So doctrine has a path, it has a trajectory, and it ends up as dogma. And so once something starts on a path, to quote Gamaliel, if it's, of, if it's of God, it will prejure. If it's not of God, it will fall away. And so you let these things go, this natural thing, but you can't senate them, you can't senate a lie or an inconsistency into a continuity just simply because it was issued by someone. Uh, Pius, when Pius IX issued the dogma of Immaculate Conception, there was a consistency of movement and development of that doctrine all the way till he makes that statement. That statement was not made out of the blue. It was not a novel interpretation. It was in no way novel. It was a, a logical progression of that which was already set in motion. Um, among the laity, some laity anyway, um, and different elements of the late team where you go to Mass and which Mass you go to. There's a big concern that Vatican II was a valid council and the documents are the obeyed, or Vatican II was not a valid council and some documents or whatever should not be obeyed. What is your take on that observation? So just to watch it, the documents in and of themselves are vastly different than the reality which it began. Yes. And so there's an inconsistency in and of itself. Right. The documents are not totally consistent with that which came before. So instead of senating the documents to that which came before, which there was an opportunity to do that, we had this two degree departure. And so when you get this two degree departure, over time the distance becomes further and further apart. And so that's what we're seeing. So which, which documents in Vatican II, uh, in the documents were produced by it, uh, are not consistent with what was before? That I can't, I'm not an I'm not a, um, expert on the Vatican II documents. The ones that, that are giving the clergy problems that usher into these possessions of clergy have to do with Lumen Gentium, have to do with its definition of marriage, which made its way into the 84 Code, and various other ones. Um, some of the later documents, the documents of Vatican II, which were written closer to the Council, 
are less problematic. And so we already start to see that two degree departure. And so that by the time we're 30 years after the council, incidentally, the right of, of exorcism, the rewrite of the right of exorcism only came out five years ago. And that was a Vatican II commission. So by the time it comes out, what are we, five years ago was uh, 2018. The council closed in what, 66? And so you're that long. And so you, you, the deviation is, is greater and greater and greater. It's just like, again, you've got a two degree separation. It's the same thing that happened in the liturgy. If you want to see what the liturgy, the Vat Mass of Vatican II, watch a Cardinal Burke Mass. That's the Mass of Vatican II as it was written. And so functionally, it's way, way different. But what happens with possession on clerics is they begin to live a clerical state that's inconsistent with tradition based upon permissions they think were given in Vatican II. Um, could you speak briefly on the efficacy of the two different, um, I don't want to say rites, because I guess they're technically the same rite, but the, the new mass, the old mass, the new rite of exorcism, the old rite of exorcism, are there any notable uh, you know, losses in uh, uh, efficacy or anything of, of that nature? Okay, so to clarify your question, uh, we've got some tangible observations. Clarify your question, define efficacy as you're using it. Um, so, for, I guess for the rite of the exorcism, um, the efficacy of the prayers in delivering that person, the, the power of the prayers, I suppose? So, power of the prayers. St. Thomas defines power as the ability to affect change. And in that case, yes, they are much more powerful. For a couple of reasons. Well, for three reasons. The new or the old? Which one? The, the old, old is oh, much more powerful. The old is the much old more powerful. The old yeah. Is yeah. 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 What did I say? Did I? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so the last reference, the pronoun was in reference to his question, which was the prayers in the old rite. So, I'm sorry about that. So, I had a program, uh, pronoun progression that I didn't share with you guys. So, the, the prayers of the old rite, the old rite is much more powerful. Now, it may not be more effective. So, the effect, the effectiveness has to do with the dis disposition of the individual to the authority of the church and the relationship with the demon. So that's a subjective criteria. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can't say it acts on this individual. Um, it's more powerful. Unless you are comparing the old right and the new right on the same individual. Mm -hmm. We've had about 10 of those that we've had an opportunity to compare. And that's very definitive. The advantage goes to the old right. And it goes for three reasons. The new right is much like the Book of Blessings. It is a blessing. It is a liturgical thing. It is full of, it's more like a liturgical thing. It's full of deprecatory language. It's full of blessing. It's, is anyone of French extraction here? Excellent. So it's the way the, <laughs> it's, it's the way the French fought World War II. So what they would do is the village would get an ammunition ration. They would go outside just out of sight. They'd fire out all, off their, all their ammo and then they'd come back and have a party. Yeah. So it's, it's largely uh, posturing. It's, it's not effective. It, it, it simply is not um, as efficacious. It's not as powerful. The old rite is very unique. What St. Charles Borromeo, the rite of 1614, St. Charles Borromeo, as a result of Trent, codifying all rites and rituals into a universal um, practice. Exorcism, he looked at all the prayers used in exorcism around Christendom and said, after reviewing all these prayers, he's going, he came up with a two-chapter uh, solemn rite. One's called the Prenotunda, Things to be Done. I got to remember to leave you with that. This quote. Um, somebody remind me. So the Prenotunda, things to be done, and it's a wealth of information in the Prenotunda. Everything known about exorcism, diabolical activity, how to diagnose, etc. And then he wrote, based on all the prayers that were being used, he wrote a very explicit formula whereby a human being adjures um, an angel, a greater being. And the language, that language is found nowhere else in any of the church liturgy. 
It is unlike those who have read it will tell you and those who have heard it will tell you that language is unlike any other in anything else you've ever read. And it was, it's very specific. It's in Latin. Latin is the last of the sacred languages. It's the last language in use in the exact same form as it appeared above our Lord on the placard on the Passion. And so the demon will yield to the Latin simply because it's a sacred language. Now the, the demon yields to the language of exorcism because he's heard that formula for 500 years. He can name that tune. He knows it. He also knows the Mass. He knows it inside and out. Incidentally, the Satanist, the Black Mass, is the Tridentine Mass that's being mocked. It's not the Ordo. It's not the ordinary form. It's the extraordinary form that's being well, mocked. That's major. There's another yeah. factor in this, I think. The, uh, the Book of Blessings and the, uh, the New Rite they take out the idea of in persona Christi. Right. The mm. priest, instead of saying, I command you, demon, as Christ, he say, oh Lord, would you please command this thing to get out? It's all deprecatory. It's no imprecatory. Yeah. yeah. It's, and that's, that's a pattern that I see all through the blessings and everything else throughout the new rites to make the priest disappear. That's yeah. precisely That's correct. That's a Father. real Protestant yeah. thing to do as a former Protestant. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the, the, it's the misunderstanding that there is such a thing as a lay priesthood. Right, yeah. And, and so that's just not a functional concept. Priests are different. Um, they are those who make sacrifice. It's we who offer, we give, we join, but you've got to have the anointed hands. You've got to have a priest. So where was I going? What was your question was which one is more efficacious? Then they're powerful. Then the story was we've had several cases where we've compared the new right to the old right in a known case. We know how the person reacts to the old. We know how, and now we know how they react to um, the the new. And there's really no comparison. He also asked though, based on sacraments like baptism and yeah, yeah, I guess um, kind of kind of globally all the sacraments. I'm yeah. just curious if there's it, it does is that um you know that right of exorcism that like that sacramental, I guess there's a difference there, but in the sacraments, is there? You know, well, here's a classic example or, or comparison is in the old rite. There are three exorcisms in baptism. There's one that occurs at the threshold of the church, another in the narthex, and the third at the font. And these are very consistent, very specific as to the choirs of angels, the hierarchies, exactly what's being done. And so the, the principle of ex operandi, you, you get what you do, you get what you ask, God will not infer. And so if you're not asking for that, he's not going to infer or assume. Um, and so just by that operation, this is why epiphany water is so powerful. This is why various things in the old rite candle blessing, all of these things, is because they were very, very specific. They were very, very complete. And so... But um, yesterday you made the analogy of sucking water out of a rag versus having <laughs> the water coming from the fountain. You said a Novus, you know, the, the book of traditional Latin versus the Novus Ordo, if you're still going to get water. What was, I thought that's when yesterday you... Yeah, and so the, the understanding is that Mass is valid. It is a valid Mass. It is a conveyance of the grace of the sacrament. It is the real presence of Christ. The thing about it is it's not the torrent that it could be. And it's been purposely occluded, impeded, and choked down. But its efficacy depends on me. What I... Uh, you, said, you said what you what do, I do with it. it uh -huh. Yep. Is... Yeah, it's, it's where, do you, where do you go from here? Uh, this is going to show my naivete, I guess, but when these books of blessings were, you know, um, when they were printed and distributed to everybody, why didn't somebody put their foot down on this? Because <laughs> that's not what the church does. Yeah. It's just simply not what the church does. And you bring up, thank you for the segue, because this is the point that I want to leave you all with because it's a perfect segue. I want to leave you with this quote if you remember nothing else. 
And that's the understanding. Why didn't the church put their foot down? Why didn't this? That's not the way the church operates. And so all liturgical manuals, all instruction books, all laws in the United States up until 1960 had the following understanding. There was an element of virtue. There was a foundational element of virtue in the person who was reading them and the person who was being governed. And here's the foundational element, and that is, if it is not prescribed, it is prohibited. What does that mean? Only do what you're told to do. If it is not prescribed, it is prohibited. Since 1960, the worldview, society, and everything has shifted to, if it is not prohibited, it is permissible. And that renders all previous legislation, everything else, inoperative. Because we operate now with, if you, if you can't show me where it says not to do it, then I can do it. And you see the absurdity that that opens us up to? Right. Next Sunday, I'll ride my Harley down the center aisle to communion. Show me in any liturgical manual where it says I cannot do it. Right. You see what I mean? Yeah. So the absurdity illustrates. But we always follow the, the understanding that if it's not prescribed, it is prohibited. Now we say, if it is not prohibited, it is permissible. It is because of this that the reasonable man concept in the law is replaced with the sign of the hand under the lawnmower with the fingers cut off. That is the shift. Do you see it? That was the P, yeah. That was the quote I wanted to leave you with. Thank you.